Howdy everybody. I pray this video finds you blessed. So this week, I have two bulb links that Doug from Paul Barnes sent me. Thank you, Doug. They're choke cherry. They've been roughed out, and I decided that I was going to make a hollow form out of them. Making a hollow form out of two bulb links is a really easy way of making a hollow form without having to have all of those hollowing tools. I'm just preparing the insides and the rims of both of the blanks before I start to do all the gluing up. I'm not concerned about shape at this point, just trying to get it nice and round and even so I know what material I have to work with. I can honestly tell you about this point in the project, I was kind of like, ugh, I really don't like this shape. Right now I'm just working on the bottom portion because that's where I'm getting the shape that I, I kind of like. So I'm looking at it going, how am I 
going to make this flow? How am I going to make it pleasing to the eye? And I kind of just stopped trying to um, shape it to what I felt it should look like, I guess, and just, just allowed myself to work with what material I had and make the best of the material I had versus trying to say, oh, well, if I had, if this was bigger or, you know, stop doing all of that and just use what I had and make the best of it and just see what happens because it's a challenge uh, for myself to, you know, just, just kind of, even if it, even if it didn't have the best shape in the end, the process of, of getting there was a learning experience. So, I'm, I can tell you the truth. At this point in in the turn, I kept stepping back and looking at it, going, "I don't know how this is gonna look good." I, I just I wasn't liking it at all. So I have another chunk of resin with the same colors. It's mixed the same way. It's just a little thicker, and I decided uh, to go ahead and use that as the opening, the top opening. Still unsure at this point how exactly how I'm going to shape it. I'm still kind of, you know, eyeballing the piece and eyeballing the resin and trying to visualize how these two pieces are going to flow together. So this wasn't something that I had all visualized in my mind. I'm kind of just, you know, going with the flow and, and trying to just do my best, like I said, with what I have. I'm still unsure at this point what I'm going to do with this chunk of resin on the rim. I just knew that I had to join the two pieces and get those flush in together. And I didn't want to take off too much material to eliminate any other possibility. I didn't want to have to keep gluing chunks on in order to make um, make the rim unique. I, I had an idea, but I wasn't sure if it was going to look good. So at this point, I'm just kind of... Um, leaving as much material as I possibly can, shaping it to where I want to go with it, and worse comes worse, I will just make the rim of it or the top of it smaller. A couple times during this turn, my lathe kept, um, the speed kept going up and down, up and down. And sure enough, I looked over at my speed dial and it's kind of going crazy. It, you can't tell it as much when you're turning, um, but you can, you can tell that the speed is very, you know, being, going differently. So my lathe's not fixed. I have to figure out what's going on there. Come to find out my tenon, uh, was really bad cracked on the bottom of the piece. I didn't plan on putting resin on the bottom of this piece too, but 
Uh, I guess this piece wanted resin on the bottom because <laughs> the tenon loosened up in the middle. So in the middle of shaping this and almost getting it all turned and done, the tenon decides to snap. So that's okay because it, it, even though it threw a monkey wrench and getting the piece finished, it helped add some more character to the piece and a design opportunity. So I'm not mad at it. <laughs> I, I actually like it better uh, with that resin on the bottom. At first when I thought about it, I was like, uh, it's just gonna look blocky and, and strange with it, resin wood, resin wood. It's just too, too uniform. Um, but after it was all shaped and, and put together and done, I, I feel that it's, it was a perfect, it was perfect for that to happen. And in that resin piece put on the bottom. A little distraction with having to put resin on the bottom kind of gave me some time to think about what I was going to do overall with the piece, especially with that new added element. It was, um, it was, you know, obviously even more of a challenge to to try to think of what the finished product is going to look like. I'm using the dial indicator on the back of the lathe to um, get my a roughed out idea of how many segments I'm going to do in this piece. These, I'm just drawing, I decided I was gonna go with flower petals. I felt that that would be uh, simpler and take it a little easy as far as the carving goes because I haven't done much um, of carving and cutting and shaping resin uh, or wood at that matter so I felt that this would be a little uh, more beginner friendly this this particular um, style for the rim I'm using my Dremel with the flex shaft and it has a diamond cutting wheel uh, in the kit that I purchased or I could have gathered some bits from somewhere and I don't remember so I don't know exactly what this this bit is called, but it is, uh, it doesn't have teeth on it. It's, it's diamond. It's a diamond bit cutting bit and it made quick work getting those off there. To make the indent of the center of the petals, I decided to use, this is a round diamond burr. It's kind of like a flat disc shape 
too. It's a little wider, and it has like a diamond uh, burrs all over it. Like I said, I don't know what these bits are called. I've just accumulated them over uh, the past couple of years, and and I don't know. I don't I don't take note of what they are or even what they do. I kind of just throw uh, bits on there and and see what happens. I so I have no idea. And right here, I'm just sanding it. Now I'm just sanding to to give it more of its flow and shape and help soften a lot of those corners. The opening of this hollow form ended up being a little larger than I anticipated, so uh, seeing everything joined together on the inside is not as attractive as it is on the outside, at least to me. And so I decided to mix up some Arteza paint and the Mix All pigments, kind of darken that, that slate gray uh, to give it a little deeper gray so the um, mouth of it would would kind of flow into the same colors as the inside and it won't be so distracting it just was distracting to me so that's why I chose to do that I've never put mica powders in my finishing um, techniques and because I'm always afraid of it being a little on the uneven side or if I have to go back and sand then some of it gets sanded away but I felt for this piece because the resin already had some gold specks in it I originally cast it with some gold and I really wanted to, to incorporate that a little bit more in the resin and in the wood as well so I decided to mix just a little bit of gold in the resin which I'm very happy and I'll be doing that technique again it it turned out really nice. It was just subtle enough and it's not too crazy like glitter would be. It's just, it's just perfect. At the end of this video, I'm going to explain what hour is. The little logo you see at the bottom left hand corner. I do want to warn you, if you do have little ones um, in the room or watching, that you please view what it is I'm going to say before you allow your little ones to hear it. I just want to give a warning. There are some words that you may or may not want to have to explain to your children after watching this, but I do want to give you a heads up. Howdy y'all. It is finished. Thank you so much Doug from Pole Barn for sending me the choke cherry pieces. He roughed out the blanks and shipped them in the mail and as soon as I got them I knew exactly what I wanted to do with them. Um, creating these types of hollow forms are easy for those who don't have the hollowing tools. So just using two bowl blanks that you may have roughed out, let set to dry, 
put them together. If you rough out two bowls from the same log, you may get lucky and be able to line up the grain if you don't wanna put some sort of piece in the center, but um, putting a piece in the center helps to separate it when the grain doesn't match. Um, I knew I wanted to use this piece here. I kind of added this later on, and of course the bottom I had to add because the tenon broke off in the middle of making this project. So this piece was a lot of new techniques, a lot of new things that I tried, and also I was kind of just going with it. Uh, I didn't know exactly how this was gonna end up being shaped, but in the end it turned out great. One of the new techniques that I used was putting some mica powder in my finish uh, so that way it kind of has like a gold glimmer. It's really, really hard to see, but it's just enough to where it adds a little bit of a, it's even like finer than glitter. So it doesn't pop like glitter would, but it has a, a sparkle, like a, I don't know, it's hard to explain. But anyways, it has a nice sparkle to it that is, uh, it's catchable with the eye, but it's not like boom too, too rough in your face. So I, I'll probably use that technique again. I really like that. Uh, also carving out resin. That's probably one of my first times I recorded it anyway. Um, carving the resin into a flower shape. I used my little, uh, Dremel tool with the cutting wheel on it. And that made quick work of getting that, uh, in the shape that I wanted it. Also, first time painting the inside of a hollow form. The hole was quite large and the inside where everything was kind of joined together, it was very distracting to me. So I decided to go ahead and paint the inside a dark color that was very similar to this grayish that's in the rim. So that to me just, it, it looked like everything flowed nicer by doing that. And then of course, my maker coin that Bob Cook makes, put the link for him in the description below so you can have yours made too. Anyways, I'm very, very happy about how it turned out. Uh, like I said, it was one of those just rolling with the punches. It kind of was just, I had somewhat of a plan, but everything else kind of just happened and I went with it. <laughs> so I'm happy about it. This piece is gonna be for sale on Art for Hour. Our is Operation Underground Railroad is a nonprofit organization founded in 2013 by a former CIA agent, Tim Ballard. Their ops team consists of a former CIA, past and current law enforcement, highly skilled operatives that lead to coordinating identification and extraction efforts regarding human trafficking. They work with law enforcement across the world to recover adults and children sold into human trafficking. They work to ensure Perpetrators are brought to justice and recovered adults and children are entered into recovery and rehabilitation programs. Since 2013, they have saved over 2,000 children. They're a nonprofit organization that relies 100% on your donations to save children. No child should be a sex slave. If you'd like to learn how, you can join the fight. The link's in the description below. You can go to Art for Hour is where I listed my item here for donation. Thank you everybody for watching the video. I pray that you have a wonderful weekend. Take care and God bless.